Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but the disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as also did his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Why don't we pray for Stuart as he comes to open up the word for us. Father, thank you that you offer us living water. Father, I pray we get revelation on on what that means today. To never thirst from the water that you give us, the life that you give us. And so we pray for Stuart as he opens up this passage once again to us and builds on what we've learnt before. And and yeah, Father, would you lead him as we talk about being Holy Spirit led? Would you Holy Spirit lead him this morning? For all his preparation, we thank you. For all his thinking and his his work on this, we thank you. And we hand over to you, Spirit, to, to lead Stuart and lead us this morning, that we might step more and more into what you have for us, that we may never thirst. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Um, It's great to be here again and uh, able to share God's word with you. Uh, Welcome everyone here in person and welcome everyone at home as well. Where can I get this living water? Uh, was the question from the passage. And and that's really what I want to have a look at today, uh, among other things. Just answering that question, where can I get that living water? Um, David Ward passed me a note just as I was um, about to step up, um, in line with what we were talking about, really, and just God's faithfulness. Uh, It just says the following, For 69 years, I will attest, all of my life, you, God, have been faithful to me. And I'm sure we all have our own stories of God's faithfulness and God's goodness. Um, Tony, I want to thank you for your word as well. Um, As you felt a few tears running down my face in that last song, and I wasn't sure why. Um, And so that's a a beautiful word. Thank you so much for that. And it's a a promise and an invitation to all of us. As I was preparing for this morning, I have got the sense that I needed to be really practical. And so I'm going to do something which could go horribly wrong later, but hopefully won't. And uh, just a a bit of a warning for you. At the end of the talk, I'm going to encourage you to get a pen and a piece of paper and to draw out uh, a map. And so you have uh, probably the next 10, 15 minutes to find yourself um, a piece of paper and a pen. Kids, you can join in too. Um, and we are going to um, draw ourselves a map. All will become clear later, but I don't want to start with that. Um, we've been talking about uh, the living water uh, passage from John 4 and, and really unpacking it over the last few weeks. Uh, in week one, we had Ian sharing about um, how we can bring kind of life overflowing from us to other people. Uh, last week, Jody talked about crossing boundaries um, and about being willing uh, and kind of available to God um, to be able to... Um, to be carriers of that living water and what that looked like. And there was so much good stuff from last week that um, if you didn't watch it, please go back and watch it because I'm deliberately not going to repeat uh, what was brilliant um, just sharing from that passage. Instead, I want to to answer the question that the woman asked, which really is, where do I get this living water? Where where do I get this from? Uh, But more importantly, what stops us? What keeps us from the living water? What is the thing that actually blocks us? 
Um, and so here's a, a bit of participation for you. Onto the live stream, if you're watching online, what do you think the biggest barrier is for us to be living life for God, to be full of his spirit and his living water, and to be the most on fire and going for it Christians that we could be? Full of God's love and power and presence. What do you think the biggest obstacle is to us? Now, there's many things you could say, you know, our sin, sickness, uh, the devil. Um, and I'm sure some of those answers will have been put up. But I read a book about a year ago and it totally shocked me. Um, and it shocked me with its accuracy and its relevance. And we've um, recommended it to you before. And so some of you will, in fact, have read it before. Uh, but it's this one. And I, I don't want to keep banging on about the same book. However, I do, because <laughs> this is absolutely brilliant. Um, it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And the thing is, if you read this book, it tells you actually the biggest thing that's threatening our, um, that's threatening our ability to be spiritual beings, to be present with God, to be led by the Spirit of God, is actually our own hurry. And it's not necessarily our fault. Our culture is very much a hurrying culture. It's very much an immediate, a next, a fill every single second. But I want to just take a few minutes to, to look at how Jesus was able to live in the opposite spirit to that. How he didn't come under this kind of sense of hurrying and rushing and never quite having enough time just to sit and to be. There's the book list 10 things uh, that are kind of symptoms of hurry sickness. And so um, I'm going to read them out. And what I want you to do is kind of uh, decide whether you kind of agree or not uh, as to whether these have been present in your life um, over the last little while. And then you can give yourself a score out of 10. Um, first one, irritability. Second one, hypersensitivity. Number three, restlessness. Number four, workaholism or non-stop activity. Uh, emotional numbness. Out of order priorities. A lack of care for your body. Escapist behaviours. Slippage of spiritual disciplines. And finally, isolation. Now, some of you might be saying, well, we're at the end of the year of lockdown. Actually, all of those uh, could be attributed to that sense of lockdown, you know, isolation, um, slippage of spiritual disciplines, looking after our body. Actually, all of these things have been challenged. But actually, I want to argue that all of these things were a challenge for us before lockdown as well. Actually, before lockdown, I remember... When everything started to close down, it was almost a sense of, oh, a bit of space. Actually, everything's a little bit calmer. And yet there remains this kind of same tiredness. We're doing less, and yet there's the same tiredness under the surface. And it's because our souls are tired. Actually, we're lacking the very thing that we need that's living water in us. And if we're not receiving it, then we can, you can be sure we're not able to share it with others. And so that's where I want to aim what we're talking about this morning, because I think in order to talk about living water and how can we carry it, first we have to be able to receive it. And so I think hurry is a real um, thing to be aware of. And, and here's another quote from the book. It says, hurry kills relationship. Love takes time. Hurry doesn't have it. And I think when you think about... Uh, you think about how, how do children define what love is. Now, most of the time, time with them will be one of the things that communicates it the most. And we're the same. Like, we really appreciate time with one another. That's, you, you know, my wife and I, we won't have a healthy marriage if we don't have time together. One of the reasons families have struggled in this last season is they haven't been allowed to have that usual time together. And without the time, that sense of, of relationship is really affected. It's really challenged. And sometimes we can be so busy hurrying to do this, this and this, 
that we can miss out on the most important thing, which is time to love one another. And so I want to argue that one of the reasons Jesus was able to be so effective and so present was because he wasn't in a hurry. He didn't have the same priorities as other people. People would come to him and say, quick, you must come and do this. And he said, no, I'm going to do this. Or he would go up on a mountain to pray and they would, they would find him and say, come down, everyone's asking for you. And he had a different set of priorities. Um, it, and he was, he was absolutely spirit-led. And I want to highlight a couple of things that we see from his life about how he did this. Firstly, he only did what he saw his father doing. And so in order to do that, you have to make time to listen to what your father's saying. At its strictest sense, it is to do nothing without God saying to do it. Mm. Obviously, that, that feels like a bit of a, a crazy thing um, to be contemplating. And, and yes, um, we can do good things. But I think the point is that sometimes we're so busy doing things that we might be missing out on the thing that God wants us to do most. Mm. Secondly, when he sent the disciples out, he sent them out to look for people of peace. In a sense, their being spirit-led was their ability to notice and to be aware and alert to who the Holy Spirit was recognising and was prompting them. The people of peace in the community. Maybe you can think of people of peace in the different communities or the different relationships that you have. You think that person has influence, that person is, has that peace. And then thirdly, God is already at work around you drawing people to himself and he wants us to join in sometimes there's a sense of pressure there's a sense of actually we need to make it all happen but actually God is drawing people to himself and he's inviting us to join him in that process and it's our responsibility to say yes I'm up for that I'm in and so where do we see that in John 4 well, we see it here. Jesus was alert and knew God was leading him to speak to a specific person. He recognised the woman as someone who he could connect with. And then God provided the words and the knowledge he needed for a wow moment. There was a mixture there. It was a mixture of his availability, the thing that he was being led to, and then the God factor. The thing that was the wow moment, that sense of a divine encounter. The words that God had given in advance to be shared. And if we're going to learn to be fountains of this living water, we need to learn how to live and to operate in the spirit of God so that we can walk in step with the spirit. And these are things we've talked about before, but I really want to get to the root of where do they begin? What's the thing that Jesus did that we can learn from where he really, like, what was his superpower? Mm -hmm. Clearly he did it brilliantly, but what was the thing that, that made it all happen so well? Because our problem is we're distracted and we're hurried and we've got so many different priorities and things demanding our attention. And our ability to stay focused on God and, and on the mission he's given us is constantly being challenged. A, I want to read a quote from the book I shared earlier. Um, because I think it speaks into this really well. It says, our new normal of hurried digital distraction is robbing us of the ability to be present. Present to God, present to other people, present to all that is good, beautiful and true in our world. Even present to our very own souls. One of my favourite verses in the Bible is from Matthew 11, where it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. <laughs> Maybe it's because I often feel like I need a rest. <laughs> but it's relevant, isn't it? How many of us breathe out, oh, yes, please, God. When we hear that invitation, come to me. In fact, God would call us to come to him and find that rest. Yes, please. That's what I need this morning. Jesus knew how to find that in God. He knew how to make time for that. We struggle to find the space and the time to connect. But he knew it, was an, it wasn't an optional extra. It wasn't something that he could just do if he had time. 
And I mean, one of the things that will most easily distract us, I would argue, is our phones. Actually, we have in our pocket <laughs> something which, you know, studies have shown that how many seconds it takes for someone before they reach for their phone. Actually, we're, there's no opportunity to get bored anymore. Actually, we fill in every blank. We, uh, we fill every moment of time. And actually, we're suffering as a result. We don't have space. We don't have a sense of quiet to be able to hear God. And if we can't hear God, there's no way we're going to be able to operate and be led by his spirit. So we need to find that. In fact, the word that gets used most often, um, in fact, let's look at um, Matthew 3, um, because it's a really uh, interesting uh, passage to look at, and I think it will lead into the point I want to make uh, best. Let's look at Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. This is a fascinating story. It's been a story that I've always thought was rather strange. I thought surely that's that's a typo. Surely that's (laughs) wrong that... Jesus, not that Jesus was kind of, um, this is my beloved son. I think that bit's right. But the bit that's always jarred when I've read it is that the Holy Spirit would then lead Jesus into the desert to be tempted. That doesn't make sense. That hasn't made sense to me in the past as I've read it. It's felt like the wrong thing, that the Holy Spirit should should bring us into places that bring life, not places that are, are wilderness and are desert and desolate. And one of the most fascinating things um, that I've discovered is the word for desert or desolate place is actually the word eremos. And this word can be translated as a number of different ways. Uh, It gets used for desert, for deserted place, for desolate place. It's also used for solitary place, lonely place, quiet place, or wilderness. And the, the one I really want to just get us to think about is quiet place because actually what if the desert wasn't a place of weakness it wasn't a place of ah, the enemy's going to attack him when he's down when he's tired when he's been fasting when he's vulnerable what if the desert was actually the place of Jesus greater strength it was the place where he was most connected Mm -hmm. to God he'd been fasting for a month and a half actually he was at the height of his connection to God and awareness of who he was and only in that place would he be able to resist the devil and come away unscathed? Yeah. Only in that place, the wilderness was his place of strength. It's why he so often went up a mountain on his own. It's why he would leave his disciples and go and find space and time. Because he knew where his place of strength was. And so he would go back there. He would find it. He would find quiet places. Sometimes when I'm really tired, I think, oh, I just need to switch off and watch some TV or watch a movie or I need to have a lie in or, you know, practical things. He didn't think any of those things was going to make a difference. He knew it was his quiet place. And so he didn't trade it for anything. Sometimes he'd get in a boat and say, let's go and find a quiet place. And by the time he got the boat to the other side, there was a big crowd saying we're hungry. And so he'd feed them, but then he'd go and find his quiet place. Even if his quiet place got challenged or he he couldn't quite get there. He'd roll with it, he'd help the people in front of him, but then, if you read the stories, he then goes and finds it. He knows he needs it. And I think my attitude to that and my expectation of quiet times and is so different from that. I haven't fully understood the strength that is there. I haven't fully understood why God is calling us to find him in that eremos, in that space Uh, And the book I mentioned earlier, it talks about the ruthless elimination of hurry. Because if you're not ruthlessly eliminating all of these distractions, then actually we won't get there. We won't find that quiet place with God. And that is what I think we really need to find. 
And Jesus was, was keen to teach his disciples as well. They joined him on the ministry and they were serving and they were, they were involved. But it wasn't long before they started getting tired. And he was saying to them, come away, find this Eremos, find this strength, this quiet place with God. We can read about it here in Mark 6. It says, the apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have time to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. And yes, you can guess which word is used there. It's Eremos. He's saying the quiet place is what you need. It's the place where we can hear God speak into our lives. And if we can't find that, we can't make that space, then actually we're not going to be able to be spirit led. We're not going to be able to be overflowing with living water from God. And when I think about the church in all its different forms, and I think about uh, the monks and the nuns and the, the different types of spirituality of what it looks like to seek God and to follow God, it makes sense to me. I think, yes, these are people who recognise the Eremos. They recognise the quiet place with God, the place of prayer, the place of connecting with him, the stripping away of all these other things, which make life full and fun and busy. But actually, are they stopping us from finding God, from finding that place with him? That's really important for us. And so I think if you take nothing away than this, find some quiet this week. You might have to fight for it. You might have to ruthlessly eliminate some things to find it. But God is calling us to find him in that place. He's calling us to find some quiet time so that we can hear his voice. If our prayers are only us telling God everything we need, everything we want, all of the situations that are going on, it's not much of a conversation. We need to create space to hear from him so that it's both ways. And I don't know how you're going to do that this week. But my challenge is try and find some. And I will as well. Maybe you're a morning person. Maybe you're an evening person. Maybe some time over lunch. There's an app called Lectio 365, which I downloaded a few months ago. Um, and the devotions, they're 10 minutes, but they're brilliant. Mm. They, they're not full of information. They encourage space to reflect and to think. And they take a passage from the Bible and they, they just unpack it a little bit. The interesting thing for me is how many days I've struggled to even make those 10 minutes part of my day. And that shows me I'm too busy. That shows me I can't even do the thing that I'm talking about. Shows me it's, it's challenged. And I'm trying to be honest to say I don't have this all together. But let's together try and prioritise this quiet place. Because that's where the rivers of living water can begin to flow out of us to the people around us. Actually, if we can't receive that peace from God, then we don't have it to offer to the world. The second thing I want to talk about this morning, and this is where you're going to need your pen and paper, is an awareness of the people who are right by us, who are around us in the places that we live and we work and we play. And I felt like God was saying, help people to see who's in front of them. Sometimes, I obviously work for church, you can feel like I don't have many relationships with people that don't know God. I don't have lots of chances to influence people and to, to share kind of God's good news with them. But actually, that's not true. And I want to, want to show how, and I want to hopefully help you to see um, how that's true for you as well. Now, I have a flip chart here. Now, this is, this is retro. This isn't a brand new thing that no one's ever tried before, obviously. But I think it's going to help us. So... Um, if you've got pen and paper, this is the time. Everyone here, you have a piece of paper hidden under your chair that I prepared earlier. Uh, and what I want you to do is, and this is the fun bit, you can do this however you want. You do not have to copy the way I do it. Um, put yourself in the middle. 
So you can draw a picture of yourself. You can write your name. Um, uh, I'm actually going to do both. So I am Stuart, but I'm going to turn that into a person. Maybe a person who's been in lockdown for too long. <laughs> there we go. OK, so however you do it, put yourself in the middle. And then the rest of the paper, we're going to split into three. So you've got three sections um, that we're looking to fill. And we're going to put in each, and one is going to be um, where you live. Uh, the second one is going to be where you work. Um, obviously, some people aren't at work, they're studying, so this could be your study one. Or if work and study aren't quite the right one to use, you could also um, use the school or the school gate. And I'm going to use the school gate for my one. And then in the last one, um, play. And again, this doesn't have to be like a specific sport, but um, something around um, kind of social life, friends, people you would hang out with um, in that sense. So I'm going to start with live. Now, for me, I'm going to interpret this as the people I literally live with or, or live around. And so if anyone's been to my house, you'll know I live in a cul-de-sac. It looks something like that. And that's all the road. And my house is here. So that's my house. Um, these are my neighbours here and here and here. And then there's more houses here, here and here. And then more on here as well. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's actually really helpful to map out who are the people that are around me all the time. And so I know this neighbour, I know this neighbour, I know this neighbour, I know all of their names, I know some of the things that's going on for them already. Um, but as you start going around, oh, well, I know, I know that neighbour does this, or I know they drive this car, but I don't actually know their name. So who's their name? Or, or what's their job? Or what situation's going on for them? And by mapping it out, you can work out how well you actually know them. Because a lot of our neighbours, we might just know to wave at or to say, hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. And that's fine. But it's worth saying, actually, I don't know that person well enough to call them by name. I don't know them well enough for X, Y, Z. Now, I've found that lockdown's actually really helped because particularly when we were leaning out of our doors at eight o'clock and clapping the NHS, we could wave our pots and pans at all of the other neighbours who were doing the same thing. And often it would lead to conversations and things like that. But try and map out who are some of the key people around where you live. And again, this is where we're trying to be spirit led as well. We're saying to God, actually, not just who's there, but who are the people there that you would really like um, me to be a blessing to, to me to pray for. Actually, if they're not people of faith, maybe they've never had anyone pray for them in their whole life. And you could get to be the first person to pray for them and to pray God's blessing for them. So again, we, you can take more time about this than I'm going to take now. But there's a sense of who are my neighbours? Who are kind of some of the key people? And again, obviously, we have hundreds of people that live around us, depending on where you define it. So maybe who are the people that you particularly feel led to? Um, the school gate, I'm going to draw what's supposed to be a book, but it probably won't look much like a book. Um, but that's what it is. And, and who are the people around school or, um, or your workplace that you particularly feel either connection to or you sense, no, this is a person of peace. Actually, this is person, someone who's open to God, who's... Um, who, who you know, I want to intentionally be praying for and asking God for conversations with. So, for example, I think a head teacher can be a really good person to pray for. They have obviously incredible influence over the school. Um, and so um, that's one of the people that I want to be uh, praying for intentionally. Now, I have three kids. So um, any one of their teachers might be a key person as well. But actually, most of my time and most of the people I talk to is the other parents, the people who are there either waiting just before or waiting just after. So it might be E's dad or L's mum or the caretaker. This is not easy to write like that. Um, 
But the point is, this is a place where God is, where I am, and I am God's person in this place. Therefore, if I'm intentional and I'm ready and I'm aware, there might be things that God wants me to do there. And it's about recognising that and saying, okay, God, I'm not just going to be there. I'm not just going to be waiting outside on my phone, (laughs) hoping I don't have to speak to anyone. I'm going to see opportunity, actually. I want to be engaging with people. I want to be be ready. And then thirdly, well, I'm going to draw a big football. Because for me, um, I love playing football. And also I am part of a football group of which there's all kinds of different people. There's people from Restore. There's kind of friends that are not part of Restore. Um, there's people that aren't Christians that have kind of joined in. There's someone I invited, and then they invited their friend. And it's all got out of hand. It's all kinds of people now. But it's a brilliant mix of community. And so what if, actually, um, I intentionally prayed for some of the people who are in that space. Because the important thing is I'm there, I'm God's person there. How can I be praying for these people and how can I be partnering with what God wants to do? Now, I've chosen three different places that work for me. Yours might be very different and that's fine as well. And some of this stuff is covered brilliantly in this book here. This is the second book um, I want to recommend this morning. Um, It's called Bless, and it's by uh, Dave and John Ferguson. And it's full of really practical things like this um, that can really help you to have a sense of who are the people in my community? How can I be a blessing to them? How can I not just kind of say hi to them, but how can I be prayerful and intentional? And it's called Five Everyday Ways to Love Your Neighbour and Change the World. And I know we've talked in the past about bless, And so some of you will even be able to remember, they all stand for a specific thing. Begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve, and share your story. I I don't even want to go anywhere near the rest. We're just going to be, and we're just going to focus on beginning with prayer. Uh, And as we do that, let's let the Holy Spirit guide us into some of the other things. Because we could easily um, invite someone around for dinner or start chatting and listening, but actually let's be led by this. And and there's four things I want that have just popped up on the screen uh, to talk about that the book kind of focuses on. It says, firstly, you need a plan. So plan when you're going to do this. When are you going to um, make time to pray for these people? And and it suggests picking six to eight. So obviously, that's only a couple from each section if you're using three sections. Or you might just say, do you know what? It's actually where I live that I feel like um, God wants me to be most present. So I'm going to pick six people from there. Uh, So firstly, have a plan. Uh, Secondly, it talks about preparing your heart. Actually, it's all very well having good intentions, but have you kind of prepared yourself to be ready to share with people? Um, What's your story? What's your testimony about what God's done in your life? That sense of preparing yourselves. Actually, I want to pray for this conversation, but if it comes up, would I be ready to respond? What are the things that maybe uh, God wants me to say to them? And so that sense of preparing yourself before you get there. Uh, The third P um, is about the places. So it's about if you have kind of some quiet time in the morning, recognising the different places that you're going to set your feet down that day. So, for example, on a Wednesday, I I might know that I'm going to be dropping the kids off in the morning. And then when I walk back, there's going to be people outside their houses going to work that I can connect to. And then in the evening, I play football. So actually the guys that I'm praying for there are going to be there. And and offering those places to God, saying, God, today, I want to be present. I want to be ready in these places. Would you lead me? Would you guide me? Let your living water flow out of me into these places today. And then the final one uh, is just a really practical one. It's it's recognising the people that are maybe on the list that you're praying for, but practical ways to bless them. Actually, you don't just have to do the spiritual praying for. You could think, actually, I'm going to buy them some flowers or I'm going to go and offer um, to look after their kids or take around some brownies or just something really practical. And again, this is where we can be led by God. It doesn't need to be a big, scary thing. It can be something really simple. What does it look like to be a good neighbour and to bless these people? What does it look like to, to pray for and just ask for God's best for these people? And again, they might not have anyone else praying for them. 
And so you could be the first person that's ever prayed for them. And so I'd encourage you, have a look at your, um, your piece of paper this week. Or if you haven't done it yet, you can either rewind and, and do it at some point during the week. Or just make some time to be before God and say, God, who are the people? What are the relationships you want me to prioritise? And how can I be a blessing in those places? So to begin with prayer is not just to start doing. It's to stop and to ask God, God, what do you want me to do? How can I be a blessing to these people? And then to take it from there, really. So three practical steps of things for this week. Number one, find some space and some quiet. Number two, write out a plan of some kind. And then thirdly, pray for and bless your people. Have a sense of who you want to do that for. For us to be spirit led and to carry God's living water to everyone we meet, we must slow down and we must make a plan. Let's respond in prayer as well. Father God, we thank you so much that you invite us to find the quiet place with you. That you're waiting for us. And that you call us to leave the distractions behind and to prioritise connecting with you. And Father, I want to say that's hard. It's contested, it's it's something that's really tricky to do. But Father, I'm going to try and make more time. I'm going to intentionally find you in that quiet place. And Father, I thank you for all the people that are around me in these specific places. Father, thank you for all the guys at football. Thank you for all the people around the school gate. And thank you for the people who are in my neighbourhood, in my street. Father, I pray you help me to be a blessing to them. And if there's specific things to do or to say or to pray for, God, would you show me? Would you lead me and guide me? And thank you that your plan for all of us is that we go on this journey with you. And so I want to say I'm in. Help me to do it. Amen.